Good evening. My name is Stephen Coughlin, and I'll be giving you this brief this evening. Uh, a little background about who I am, because I would have to classify myself as something that is an accidental expert, and not by my app, uh, attribution. I'm, I've been designated that by people who wanted to bring me in. But uh, sub subsequent to 9-11 happening, September 11th, uh, 2001, I was mobilized onto the uh, active duty uh, for the war on terror. And I was on active duty as early as October 2001 and was assigned to the Joint Chiefs of Staff Director for Intelligence where I worked in the targeting division. And while mobilized for roughly 30 months, I worked there. Then I worked on uh, the Open Source Information Center and a couple other positions that are better left unsaid. Supported many uh, operations, uh, likewise, that are better left unsaid. But when it came time to basically uh, coming around to demobilizing, I realized that there was a serious problem about how we were systematically disregarding what I would like to say is the enemy's stated basis for their stated reason when they self-identified themselves as jihadis who were fighting jihad according to Islamic law. And actually put it in writing, put a series of briefings together where I think it's fair to say I was always able to prevail on the facts, the facts and one of those facts being published Islamic law as mapped against the fact of the stated objectives of groups like Al-Qaeda and the stated objectives of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. Back then we knew the Muslim Brotherhood was bad, okay, uh, for those who knew who they were at all. Now, the thing about this is when I demobilized, I actually wrote a long letter saying because you refuse to take this into account, the role of Islamic law in the formation, formulation of jihadi war doctrine, here are the following things that are going to happen. And to be truthful, I don't quite remember what they were, but then I demobilized and went back to my private sector job. I'm a private sector person by heart or by desire. I have never really wanted to work in this space. Uh, the day I'm able to, I will leave and go back to the private sector. I did go back. About 18 months later, I just randomly bumped into the senior civilian on the Joint Staff Intelligence downtown D.C., literally coming out of the uh, metro, and he said, hey, look, that I'd, I'd really like you to come to talk to us again uh, because um, you remember that paper you wrote? And I said, uh, yeah, I, I kind of do. He says, you realize that everything you said there came true. I said, yeah, I remember that. And he says, no, we were just looking at this. It came exactly true. And I said, yes, I, I, I understand that. And what he asked is if over the Christmas break around 2005, that I could come in and brief, uh, brief up and talk to the senior intelligence officers, including the uh, general, the J-2 uh, general officer, about how I looked at it. Now, I was very unsure about this because I had left being a little bit uh, cynical about how products were being generated, so I figured if they want me to come in and brief, I'm going to tell them what I think. And so I made sure that that brief ended with me saying, there's a point reached where the outsourcing of your understanding of a thing leads to your outsourcing of the decision making on it. I want to make it very clear when I gave that briefing that as far as I was concerned, our intelligence effort was outsourcing the information requirements to fight the war on terror to third parties, many of whom they would not had not even ascertained were American citizens or able to hold security clearances. So I'll go there. So the unclassified briefing to, again said you all cl at a, at a certain point where you know you don't know that when you outsource your knowledge of a thing, you've actually outsourced your decision making on that thing to the people who you gave the authority to make the decisions on. I was wondering whether I'd be thrown out basically saying that, and the truth of the matter is they asked me to come on full time, which I did, and uh, I did at their request. So. Um, between that and still being a reserve officer who was, was then assigned to uh, uh, CENTCOM, I, I did transfer to CENTCOM. I worked this issue for many years, had a phenomenally good track record, and um, ran into some problems when some people in the Assistant Secretary of Defense or the Deputy Sus Secretary of Defense wanted me moved out, not because I was wrong. I've never had someone articulate a, a actual reason of something I actually said that they could actually show was wrong. It's always somebody said that I said when they were at a briefing and I asked who said that. Because I'm actually pretty clear about what I say. So 
Um, in the process, I was a member of the, uh, I was a student, I was a student at the uh, Joint Forces, uh, excuse me, I was a student at the Joint Military Intelligence College, which is now the National Defense Intelligence College, to which I wrote my master's thesis on uh, Islamic law and how it, how it facilitates the radical narrative. Now, a very clear point I want to make here, I don't actually have to prove that the jihadis are correct in their understanding of Islamic law to argue that they base it on that. I just have to prove that they make arguments that they believe are based on Islamic law and based on that they act in a certain way, that way being to kill Americans and destroy and, and, and affect adversely U.S. American interests. So long as I could prove that, what it means is Islamic law is in. Now, what does that mean? It means, let's just say we would have two courses of action. We could have many, but on, on either pole, one course of action is groups like Al-Qaeda say they fight jihad according to Islamic law, and we look at Islamic law and it's incorrect, in which case that generates one course of action. What's that course of action? That, hey, Al-Qaeda is wrong about why they say they're fighting jihad. or. Al-Qaeda says they base their, their uh, decisions on Islamic law, and lo and behold, we can find Islamic law that pretty much says what Al-Qaeda says. Well, that creates another course of action. But do you see, so long as Al-Qaeda says they base their war-fighting doctrine on Islamic law, there is no way to understand Al-Qaeda and their threat doctrine without understanding the underlying Islamic law. It is my position, and it's one that I've voiced since 2003, still in uniform, that if you don't understand Islamic law, you do not understand Al-Qaeda. You do not understand the Muslim Brotherhood, and nothing comes close. Okay? Um, if somebody wants to argue that point, please, just make it a professional argument. Show me real Islamic law that you want to put in opposition to the stuff we're able to generate so, for example, it's my position that what we need to do is we need to base our decision on that Islamic law as published by sources that are recognized as uh, authoritative in the Islamic community. So, for example, ICNA, Islamic Circle of North America, just had their uh, convention over the uh, Labor Day, we uh, Memorial Day weekend this weekend, uh, 2012, and here we have it. They're selling the Noble Quran, okay? and we read the annotated version of the Saudi edition of that Quran. We get stuff like the uh, authoritative translation of the uh, Hadith of a, a Muslim. We also find what Al-Qaeda is writing. We read what they say. We see if they cite Islamic law. The first thing we do is say, did they cite it? Does it exist? And the answer is typically yes. Did they cite it in context? Well. That becomes an issue to be determined. But what does it mean that when we look at Al-Qaeda writings that we could at least say that exists? And what it means is we have to look at it. And the question will not be do you agree or disagree with it. The question will be can members of the Islamic community reasonably look at that production of, of a case, their argument, and decide that it has merit? Well, we're 10 years into a war on terror that says that there's a sizable percentage of the population that does. How can you conceivably decide that you can know them without knowing that? So what I'd like to do is I would like to uh, show the things I have been briefing, specifically the topics that I was briefing when I was at the Joy Forces Staff College about a number of months ago that has caused so much fury in the media where there's so many things said about what I said, I think the best thing to do is show you what I've briefed. Now, I always brief at the uh, military colleges in a compressed way, and that's why I use uh, an executive brief what I, that I call the Hill Brief. Why do I call it the Hill Brief? Because at some point I ran into a situation where I made a brief for the military. I would make a brief for stuff I put on Capitol Hill. I would make a brief for some local communities and realize that they could have a tendency of drifting. And someone could say, well, that's not what you were saying to us. And I realized what I really needed to do was make one consolidated brief. And although that Hill brief has many sections of it, many of the times I don't brief all parts of it, I can always say I'm briefing off the same narrative. 
off the same message. And always know that I, I, I'm tracking so people will understand that if I'm at the Joint Forces Staff College, well, that is what I briefed up on the Hill to some members. Or if I'm up on the members, I do brief that down there. And both sides ask that question. The, uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, run through the following topics uh, in, this, in this series of presentations today. Uh, I'll ask what version of Islam do, we, do, do I look at? And I'd like to point out through a, a small little discussion that we try to use a version of Islamic law that can reasonably be said to be ubiquitously present and available in the Islamic stream of commerce uh, for the books you could buy at things like Islamic Muslim Brotherhood conferences in America, hence the books we just talked about. But it also includes the collected works of people like Syed Qutb, the collected works of people like uh, Maududi from Pakistan, and others besides, so that we can read them and we can understand what it means. What does it mean, however, that the Muslim Brotherhood, almost every conference we go to, or every conference our people will show up at, you can see all the booksellers have ubiquitous collections of Muslim Brotherhood track literature, including um, Saeed Qutb, Hassan al-Banna, and, and others. It means that they, they might be tracking with this stuff. So then I'll follow for it with a short discussion on what is jihad and Islam, and we'll restrict ourselves to the things that we can quote from Islamic sources when they're commuting, communicating to an Islamic audience. Why am I making this point? I think it should be said that when we looked at the Soviet Union, we knew they read, wrote stuff for us to read. And what did we call that? It was propaganda. So we would always look at, at what they might have written on page one of Krasnaya Svezda, the Red Star magazine, to see what they were saying when they knew they would translate it. But then we would take a look at what was actually going on, and we'd measure, measure the delta. So we got copies of the Soviet training manual, Soviet military power, and we spent an enormous amount of effort getting it correctly translated. And in fact, we created the National Training Center to have our forces fight against entities that fought according to those doctrines. In this war, what am I saying as it relates to the war on terror? Why are we going to Barnes & Noble? Why are we going to Amazon and getting books that you would read like you wanted to read what is the Catholic Church? What is Judaism? What is Hinduism? When what we really need to write, because they're written for you, the, the non-believer who has no understanding, to come up to some understanding. When we know that what, what the Muslim Brotherhood or the Al-Qaeda Al are looking at are actual books of Islamic law. Published by people who are recognized to publish it inside the Islamic community. So here's my rule. If you want to get in the game, I don't care who you read for your own personal edification, Karen Armstrong, Esposito, but when you want to get into the threat analysis, we need to look at the books that Al-Qaeda looks at when they cite it. We need to look at the hadith that they're citing and make a, de make a determination. Are these hadith authentic? Did they make it up or is it real? Does it say what it says or doesn't it? Is it according to the rules Al-Qaeda is asserting or isn't it? To get into the game, to have your counter argument meet some, to defeat some hearsay argument, I think what you need to do is make yourself realize that until you're reading stuff written by Muslims who are recognized in the Islamic community as expertized and, authority, and authoritative enough to write on the subject, for a Muslim audience, you're really not in the game. So we can look at things that were written by, for example, certain authors who wrote something for the non-Muslim audience to read and the Muslim audience to read. And people have many times recognized that there's a delta. So for the purpose of assessing threat doctrine, let's read what is written for Muslim audiences by Muslims. So the next thing we'll do is we'll go take a look at this concept of the complete way of life and what that means, and take a look at this, this concept. And I sometimes think it's not fully or, or well explained called taqiyya, dissimulation or lying, and how it is or is not sanctioned in Islamic law. Followed by what I think is the most important topic to get your hands around from the perspective of how to understand how the out groups like Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brother formulate their thinking, and that will be the concept of abrogation. And to make it clear that this concept of abrogation is real, we will map it to the Muslim Brotherhood uh, document called Milestones, written by Said Qutb, that basically operationalizes the Muslim Brotherhood threat doctrine 
through its application of the rules of abrogation when they write their doctrine. Why is this important? Because Muslim Brotherhood groups will insist that this concept of abrogation is not real and that you should not look at it. And if it is real, it's taken out of context by extremists. But the problem is we're not interested necessarily in how the entire Muslim population looks at abrogation. We are interested in how the extremists who are killing Americans look at it. And we are interested to see what the fit is. And it just comes down to a question of whether or not they are able to make the argument. Does abrogation exist? Well, the answer is we have clearly found publications that say that it does, that have some, that on, their, on its face, have some ability to show that this is a real concept. And we're able to show over and over and over again that the Muslim Brotherhood relies on this concept of abrogation when it executes what I will call the milestones process that was written by Syed Qutb while awaiting execution in an Egyptian jail in 1966. So, how serious is this? Just take a look at Major Hassan's briefing, the one he made for fellow U.S. military officers, where he specifically said that he was executing his plan to become a jihadi in part based on the rule of abrogation. He says it right in his briefing. If you understand that the, 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 the violent extremists inside the Muslim community use this concept of the milestones process as mapped to the Islamic doctrine of, of abrogation, what you begin to realize is that you can, you can forecast what they're doing, what they're saying, where they're going. It's not going to tell you that they're going to have a terrorist attack in that town at 2 o'clock, but it will tell you what their posture is. And we have been, I have been able to have some measure of accuracy in doing that. And so we're going to transition to the next part of it, which will be, the next part of this brief we'll consider, we'll look at the timeline brief. And what is it, what's important about the timeline brief? Back in the summer of 2010, I was asked to put a brief together for some members of Congress to explain what DHS and FBI were calling the lone wolf syndrome. And what I showed was that the lone wolf syndrome, as explained by the uh, DHS and FBI, is actually a form of jihad called individual jihad. And then show that with the first publication of Al-Qaeda's magazine, um, Inspire magazine, they said that they are changing their strategy and they're going to go to uh, terrorist activities or jihadi activities that are focused on individual jihad. Well, it was very interesting I did that because over the course of the summer and into the fall, we realized that this, this strategy may be picking up momentum. In fact, over the course of 2010, um, a man named Akef, who was the supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood, stepped down, and a man named Badi, uh, took charge of, of the Muslim Brotherhood and in October 2010 he said we're going to get into this we're going to go more operational and get more confrontational and we were very surprised because what did that mean? Up until then the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda were trying to put distance between themselves and now they basically said they were coming into alignment with what Al-Qaeda was saying. It was right about the time of December 2010 that we started briefing in earnest at very high levels, especially on the Capitol Hill, did at the FBI field office, okay, that the entire Middle East was going to come down, that it was going to be a Muslim Brotherhood operation from the very beginning, and here was what the markers were to look for. It's called the timeline brief, and I will give this. Why? Because it will show how accurately we could forecast events that became known as the Arab Spring in later February 2011 that we were able to say there's no Arab Spring. There isn't. It's all this. And now people are starting to realize that this may well have been exactly what we said with specificity is what it was, a Muslim Brotherhood operation. Finally, we will end this presentation with a quick look at the OIC so we can get an understanding of who they are, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, formerly the Organization of Islamic Conference, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, uh, and see how, how their activities have influenced something we call the disappearing language that has been briefed many times by members of Congress, including on the, on the, on the House floor.